You may have seen lots of coverage in the news media about real estate commissions and various lawsuits in multiple states against the National Association of Realtors and some of the country's largest brokerage firms. If you're contemplating buying or selling, you may be wondering how this affects you. That's going to vary from state to state, and the courts will probably be working on this for years to come. I'm licensed in Texas, so that's the perspective I will cover. Texas has a history of being very protective of the consumer when it comes to real estate transactions, so there's not likely to be a profound effect here, at least not in the near future. Before I go any further, please let me disclaim here that I am not an attorney and I don't work with or represent any of the parties in this case. These are my personal opinions and editorial views presented only for your consideration, not as a statement of law. If you're not familiar how real estate commissions are negotiated and paid, it helps to have an in-depth understanding of how real estate transactions work. Most real estate transactions take place between individual buyers and sellers. But their complicated nature means that most people rely on a number of professionals to help facilitate the transaction. It's not as simple as a basic retail transaction where a sales clerk is employed by a store to sell goods that the store's owner has bought from a wholesaler. When you buy an automobile, the car may be owned by the dealer, but it may also be owned by the manufacturer or another third-party financer who carries the inventory until it is sold. In the case of a real estate transaction, the property is not usually owned at any point by an intermediate party. It can phase directly from the seller to the buyer. So how do the seller and buyer find each other? Well, that's where we come in. When a seller decides to sell, they will enlist the help of a trusted agent licensed by the state to solicit real estate transactions on behalf of a broker. Likewise, a buyer will hire their own agent to assist with their home search, provide access to properties, and help them evaluate the value of each of the properties relative to their needs. Using the brokerage's systems and services, the transaction moves through an escrow officer who ensures that the seller receives the funds granted to them by the contract and that the buyer receives clear title to the property. So how has all of this ended up in the courts? There are actually several agreements that will already be in place between various parties before a buyer and seller enter into a sales contract. Let's go back to our flowchart and look at the places where those contracts already exist. In order to sell a property in Texas, our listing agent signed a brokerage agreement with their broker that stipulates the conditions under which the agent will bring business to the brokerage. This includes the rules and parameters for establishing fees for the broker's services. It also defines how those fees may be split between the broker and the agent. With the agent-broker relationship established, the agent may then bring business to the brokerage by creating client agreements on the broker's behalf. That listing agreement will detail what listing services the agent will provide, as well as the fees the brokerage will charge, and how those fees may be shared with a buyer's agent. This arrangement, known as cooperative compensation, is an agreement between the seller and listing agent that the fees charged by the brokerage will be shared with the buyer's broker to encourage buyer's agents to show their buyers the property. Likewise, on the buyer's side, the buying agent has a similar agreement to bring business to their broker, though the details of that agreement may be different from brokerage to brokerage and even agent to agent. While most brokers have similar agreements with the agents within their office, the terms negotiated for those brokerage contracts may vary widely from brokerage to brokerage. Just like the seller's side, once the agent-broker relationship is established, the buyer's agent can begin using the brokerage's systems and services to assist buyers in acquiring properties. Most agents, including myself, always use a buyer's representation agreement that outlines what services they can expect and how I will ultimately be paid for those services. That may include compensation shared by the seller's broker as detailed on the MLS for any given property. The confusion comes from the question about how these people are paid and disagreements about the answer to that question. Ultimately, the buyers and sellers through their agents will negotiate who pays for these fees and services. Unlike our straightforward retail comparison, it can get a little murky, hence the lawsuits. So back to our handy flowchart, let's look at the listing side. In negotiating the listing, the selling agent and seller will arrive upon a fee for the listing service that falls within the parameters defined by the agent's brokerage rules. To vary from those rules may require permission from the broker as the broker's business model, budget, and ability to survive are based on receiving a minimum amount of compensation from each client. Likewise, if a broker requires a fee that is too high, the seller may look for other brokerages for more favorable terms. While it may seem counterintuitive, a listing agent will often recommend that their client offer to pay the buyer's agent. 
This makes the property more attractive to the buyer because it prevents the buyer from having to pay a commission, which may make an affordability difference. It also ensures the buyer uses an agent, which reduces the risk of errors or the chance for impropriety. The brokerage fee doesn't change, but the seller allows the brokerage to offer part of the fee as commission to the buyer's brokerage. On the buyer's side, the agent also has an agreement with their broker to bring a certain amount of compensation to the firm for each transaction. This compensation is negotiated in the buyer's representation agreement, which generally allows for this to be paid by the seller if offered. Depending on the fees agreed upon by the buying side and the commissions offered by the selling side, the buyer may be asked to pay for none of, some of, or all of the commission. In Texas, listing agreements required for all publicly marketed properties include the total fee charged for brokerage services, generally expressed as a percentage. It also shows which portion of that fee may be offered to the buyer's broker. While these fees are totally negotiable, most brokerages have a similar expense structure to cover, so the fees charged are thereby similar from brokerage to brokerage. Until now, buyer representation agreements have technically been optional in Texas, although most agents, including myself, require them in order to do business with a client. The representation agreement includes the minimum fee acceptable to the broker, as well as language explaining that the fee may be paid through cooperative compensation if it is offered by the seller. Since most brokerages have historically operated under similar expense structures, these numbers have always been well aligned. So how has all of this ended up in the courts? Through a class action grievance, a group of plaintiffs have claimed that they were forced to pay for brokerage services without their knowledge, that fees for services were concealed from them, or that brokerages in certain markets colluded to set specific fees, thereby dismantling a competitive market. Real estate brokerages and the National Association of Realtors countered, saying that the fees are not set by collusion, they are just coincidentally similar, and that they can be negotiated by the parties of the contracts. But NAR is a national association, and the licensing of real estate professionals is left to the states. So there were undoubtedly some inconsistencies in how forms were worded and contracts were written across the country. Because brokerage contracts on both sides of the deal were similar and expense structures among brokers were historically similar, many sellers felt like the decision to pay the buyer's broker was forced upon them by the system rather than by market forces. With the advent of the internet and mobile data, technology companies began to challenge the historic cost structure of running a brokerage and look to disrupt the industry by finding ways to list houses for lower fees to the seller. By lowering expenses and cutting services, these discount brokerages were charging lower fees to list homes. Meanwhile, brokers and their agents were working as hard as ever showing those houses, negotiating the offers, performing due diligence, and securing the finances to make the sales happen. Buyers were stretching their finances to afford the house and weren't eager to pay their agents to buy homes without cooperative compensation. So what did the courts decide? In some cases, the courts found in favor of the plaintiffs, and in the case of Keller Williams and the National Association of Realtors, settlements were reached outside of the courts. While the rulings are still fresh and the courts have to finalize the rulings, they have made it clear that changes will be required in the way that agents and their brokers communicate fees and costs to their clients. So back to our original question, how does this affect you as a buyer or seller? I'd like to think that my business, operating under the guidelines that have long been established in Texas, won't see a lot of change. I've always tried to be transparent and honest with my clients about costs and fees. There are a few places, however, where changes in practice will be required and market dynamics may begin to take effect in reaction to those changes. Buyer representation agreements have always been an option and I have always used them. They will now be required for all real estate transactions involving an agent on the buyer's side. I anticipate some changes in wording to make negotiable points more obvious, but I don't believe the use or impact of these forms will change a lot. Another big change is that offers of cooperative compensation may no longer be made clear on any MLS. This means that listing agents can no longer specify in the listing any commission amount that they are offering to share with the buyer's agent. When shopping for homes, a buyer will no longer have any idea whether the seller and their agent are offering to cover any, some of, or all of the buyer agent's compensation. If you go back to our previous market comparisons, retail sellers pay all of the selling costs associated with selling their products. Overhead, packaging, processing fees, and all of that. Those costs are covered in the price of the products in the form of markup, and it's not detailed to the consumer. 
The shoes you buy at Macy's, for example, are priced to cover all of the costs the store will bear in bringing the shoes to the consumer, including the commission for the sales associate. The sales receipt doesn't detail the commission rate for the customer. It's simply included in the price of the shoes. Customers want and deserve clear representation of the costs they're going to incur, whether they are buying or selling. But this current settlement creates multiple negotiation points at different times during the transaction, making things even more confusing. In order to satisfy disclosure requirements, buyers may agree up front to pay commissions that they could later learn their sellers would have been willing to cover in order to get the home sold quickly. Another strong argument for seller paid commissions revolves around buyer's financing. Buyer paid commission requires more cash at closing from the buyer, which is often tight in the best of circumstances. Mortgage lenders will not finance sales commissions paid by the buyer, so these would have to be paid in cash at closing, along with down payments, points, and other buyer expenses. We aren't likely to see any real changes until mid-July when the court rulings are set to begin. By that point, most states will have revised their forms and every MLS will have to reformat their listings to be compliant with the new laws. Meanwhile, stay tuned to my channel for updates as they occur. If you subscribe and click the notifications bell, you'll be the first to know when more details are available. As always, thanks for watching.